Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second National All Jersey Nutrition Webinar. My name is Laura Daniels, and I'm happy to be your host today. I am a Jersey dairy producer from Cobb, Wisconsin. We milk about 300 cows here at Hartwood Farm. I also have over 20 years of experience in working in dairy cattle nutrition across the upper Midwest. And recently, I started a company where I'm going to be doing labor management consulting. So I'm happy to be involved with this webinar series and happy to be here with you today. Today, we will be doing the second part of our transition cow portion of the webinar. Today, we will be focusing on more of the fresh cow monitoring. Uh, previously, we spoke about close-up cows, and you can look forward to future webinars dealing with the milking herd as well as calves and heifers. The next broadcast of our webinar will be on September 27th, and that will also be at 3 p.m. Eastern. Since you signed up for today's webinar, you will receive notification that that one is coming up as well. It, let me see. Now, also, um, I would like to remind you that if you have questions, we would love to hear them. And so please use the chat function, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, go ahead and get yourself acquainted with that. And feel free to send questions whenever you do have them, when they come up. At the end of the webinar, we will have, we will open it up for live question and answers with our three experts from Pine Creek Nutrition. You can expect that the video, which we'll be playing shortly, will be about 18 minutes long. And after that, we'll move into the questions. The experts, once again, who are the host of today's webinar and who will be joining us for questions are Jim Tully, Cameron Nightingale, and Todd Stroop, all from Pine Creek Nutrition. If it's anything like the first webinar, the question and answers will be just as insightful as the information shared during the webinar itself. And so with that, I will have Drew, who is helping us orchestrate this behind the scenes, go ahead and get that video started. So we kind of talked about the close-ups a little bit. Now we're going to talk about, you know, monitoring, sorry, monitoring fresh cows. Um, you know, as I said, many interactions between the production diseases exist, and cows tend to be more likely to get one disease given the incidence of another one. Um, one thing that we do fairly routinely, and, and I think is becoming more commonplace, in consultancy or even on dairies by themselves, there's a lot of cow side tests available. And if it's not cow side, pulling a tube of blood is cow side, and you can get it right to a diagnostic lab, or, or there's a number of, of options to get those analyzed for different things that we're looking at. Um, the first one is I'll, I'll jump back to pre fresh. Um, so, monitoring, so back to the subclinical ketosis or clinical ketosis. What that is is a disease resultative of cows mobilizing too much body fat because they're in negative energy balance and they need to use those body, body reserves for energy. Um, and that is where a cow has switched from using glucose as their primary energy source to mobilizing that fat. The liver has to process it and, and kicks out ketone bodies as a result of that. Um, which are just an alternative fuel source for smooth muscle and, and brain, etc. Um, the issue here is so so most to all cows um, are going to mobilize some fat and be in negative energy balance as we approach calving. So taking taking a blood sample pre-fresh, and I say pre-fresh, it needs to be five or greater days before calving or expected calving days, just so we don't sample a cow and get a um, a misleading result because she's already declined in dry matter intake. Um, but as long as we're four or five days plus before she's due to calf, taking a blood sample and have it analyzed for NEFA or non-esterified fatty acid um, can give us a good indication of the risk factors associated or, or what could happen if, if we don't correct something backstream, if you will. Um, 
so it, so NIFA is basically a measure of how much fat is being mobilized um, in a quantitative way, whereas BHBA or beta hydroxybutyrate is a metric of that fat that was mobilized getting turned into ketone bodies and being used for energy. So it's basically an efficiency metric of the fat mobilized and, and being used as an energy source. And, and we would generally use the DHBA after cap, right? Correct, correct. Okay. Yep. So pre-fresh, we're, we're going to get that sample. And if we've got, you know, generally over 15 or 20 percent of those samples greater than um, 0.3 and that's in micro equivalents per liter is the generalized or standardized lab output um, there should probably be an intervention and, and it's very likely a dry matter intake and is it heat stress cold stress moving stress lack of feed em empty bunk syndrome uh, you know a number of other things but it would be it would an incidence higher than 15 or 20 percent of those samples would, would and should justify an, an intervention of some sort. Okay, and then we jump to post fresh, and that sample population should be five to 15 days in milk. So we're not sampling the cow that has just kept. There, there is some data and some other other consultants recommending three days is probably okay. But again, I'd rather not have misleading results. Uh, because again, we're going to use this information. It's not just going to get filed in the circular or uh, entered in the computer and never looked at again. These, these are good metrics that we're actually going to make a management decision off of. So anyway, sampling the same number of cows as we talked about before, probably 12 in your herd is, is adequate. Um, but looking at um, a BHBA level of greater than 1.2, and that's in millimoles per liter, uh, is kind of the alarm rate at again 15% of, of those samples. Would so anything over 1.2 is, is indicative of subclinical ketosis. Um, and the nice thing about BHBA, and, and probably in my opinion a little bit more important than the NEFA sample pre-fresh, the BHBA can be done cow side as well. Uh, there's the precision extra handheld meter you can buy at your local uh, pharmacy or Walmart or on Amazon. Um, the strips are generally one to two dollars a piece so per, per, per cow it's going to be one to two dollars. Uh, but you know spending twenty dollars a week or every other week is is you know can, can provide some very meaningful data and information to intervene. Um, and then the, the third measure is also another post-fresh metric, but what is our blood calcium levels uh, at that five to 15 days of milk? You know, we said earlier that her, her stores of calcium or everything she's got in the tank is mostly dumped into that first colostrum and first milk. Um, a measurement to tell us how well she's replenished those stores and has enough calcium to, to do what she needs to do as a high-performing athlete um, is another uh, quick and simple blood blood sample. Um, there's been a lot of debate on what the level or, or target range should be to indicate subclinical hypocalcemia or milk fever. Um, I think a lot of the most recent stuff says less than, than 8.6 milligrams per deciliter. Older data says 8.0. Whatever number you look at, it, it's a good thing. You should do it. You should monitor those cows. And again, it'll give you your average, your range, and the trends for your herd. Again, your cows may be just fine at a 7.8, or maybe they need to be at 8.6 or 8.7. Um, but, but the key is to, to monitor, measure, and manage it. Um, the fix for most of these things is to let Jim and Todd say, <laughs> what's the fix for most of these things? Dry matter intake. <coughs> there we go. And cow comfort. Well, cow comfort. And if you have proper cow comfort, you probably will get the dry matter intake because some of the rations put you on the proper one. Absolutely. I'm standing here and thinking about all the cow comfort things we can do, especially in like hot weather where we need to have fans, we need to have soakers. And we don't just need them on milk cows, we need them on those close-ups. They're going to be the most important. And far dries. And far dries. There's been a lot of research 
and everybody who knows me, I'm not a huge research guy, but I like to look at it. Um, cooling of dry pals is so important in how they're going to respond in that next lactation. I mean, you got to keep the cows cool. Um, so, kind of kind of wrapping up some of the rules for successful transition, and we did just kind of hit on these, but but monitoring for disease incidents um, to kind of to kind of put some some evidence with the numbers I gave you earlier. You know, with NEFA levels pre-calving greater <laughs> than 0.3, you know, we're right around two times more likely to get ketosis, VA, metritis, or an RP. Um, Furthermore, and this is more downstream things that probably aren't as easily identified on a commercial dairy. It takes some research data to, to get down, but you can trust that it is relative to your operation. But cows are 20% less likely to become pregnant um, than those animals with low levels of NEFA pre-fresh. Um, and then also another fairly manageable thing or measurable thing is cows have nearly left uh, 1,500 pounds less ME305 mil in the subsequent lactation after that after that high meat test um, when compared to their peers that had good or adequate levels. Uh, and then so on the BHBA, so when when those post fresh BHBA levels are greater than 1.2, indicating subclinical ketosis. Um, cows are two to seven times more likely to get a DA metritis ketosis, or sorry, a DA metritis or an RP. It's fairly indicative that they have ketosis. Um, and then they're 10% less likely to become pregnant. And then they have less predicted 305 ME milk. It, it's not quantified, but I've seen anything between 400 pounds and, and about 2,500 is what some of the literature uh, has to say. Uh, and then I'm going to kind of pass over to Todd here on practical suggestions and key considerations of, of that successful transition. Just to reiterate some of the things we've discussed here uh, and the main differences that we see between the jerseys and the Holsteins. Obviously for the jerseys we feel like they're more sensitive to some of the requirements, uh, especially on the calcium levels. Uh, possibly even the magnesium levels in the close-up diet. Uh, actually, that would translate into the early transition period too in the first two to three weeks after calving. Um, the main things are to do everything you can to support dry matter intake in those animals. Uh, whether it's cooling pens, uh, more room in the close-up pen, you don't want any crowding. Uh, the 80% number has always been a good rule of thumb. Um, one thing we didn't discuss, and this is something that would be very farm specific, would be to adjust the days of the dry period according to the gestation that you see on your farm. Uh, this gets more critical at certain times of the year, like in the summertime, when they tend to have a shorter gestation period. And also, with all the sex semen we tend to use in the Jersey breed, um, they're going to calve a little bit earlier than when they have both calves. So these are some numbers that you seriously need to look at so that you guarantee a minimum number of days in that close-up pen. So if you're just moving cows off your list, and let's say your target is 14 days, and you missed your gestation by almost a week, and then you missed your move to close by a week, you know, one move day, then you just basically created zero days in the close-up for that cow. So uh, we, we actually see that very often. Yeah. I mean, the cows that fall apart, you go back and their move to close-up date or, or time in the right. close-up is, is very limited. Yeah, and even if you use 21 to 28 days, you end up at 14, but then you end up at seven. I mean, that that is not good. Uh, we gotta get these cows ready for the next lactation. Um, Water availability should go without saying, but some people still don't have enough water availability in the close-up um, Keeping keeping everything clean, um, you know, regular cleaning days. Um, if you have more cows coming through your close-up pen, you want to make sure you're cleaning it more often um, because not only is that not good for the calf, 
the cow can also pick up things in the manure and everything which can cause disease later. And many of these things, you know, they're going to help with colostrum. Um, colostrum harvests the mouth quality, which is going to be critical of that Jersey calf, which we all know is really hard to raise Jersey calf. So we want to make sure we have all these items in order. And I'd say, Todd, when you, um, I think we've, we've seen quite a bit as we get into fall, and this is a general thing I know we've discussed a number of times, but colostrum yield yeah, in to jerseys reduce. tends to go down fairly considerably in places where we've, we've honed in with, with our dairy clients and working on these things. It, it still drops, but it's not near as dramatic. Right. Um, and I think a lot of that, again, is related to the cow comfort issues, mm -hmm. and these jerseys respond to cow comfort. And cooling um, and dry cows and right. a lot of things. And, you know, it's never one thing that's going to make the difference. It's the combination of all these things put together that are going to make your close-ups do well and have your fresh cows come in like you want them to. I think what we'd like to do now is, is finished, or, or finish with each of us having a, a comment on a distinction between the jerseys and, and Holsteins or other breeds that we see in our nutrition practice. Um, Todd, why don't you go ahead and give us a thought? Well, I think one thing I've learned over the years, um, working with jerseys, milking jerseys, managing jerseys, and now feeding jerseys, is probably the calcium, how critical the calcium levels are. Uh, not only on the decad diets where we need to have plenty of calcium available, in the bloodstream um, and we usually shoot for 180 to 200 grams I think 200 is better uh, but that's going to depend on what we talked about before dry matter intake um, and then on the milking herd I also believe that the percent of calcium needs to be over 1% sometimes on those fresh cows as high as 1.05% of the total ration um, but it also has to be a calcium that they can utilize uh, so much of our rock calcium, you know, calcium carbonate, limestone products, um, if they're not ground finely enough, you might show it on your ration that the cows aren't getting it. So we have to be careful of all those types of things when we're looking at feeding these Jersey cows. Yeah, so I'll piggyback off of Todd and, and some differences that I see uh, with the Jersey herds that we work with versus Holsteins. Calcium's super important, but the regulation of calcium is super important. So I'll go back to the DCAD diets. And I think from our observations and practical experience, uh, Jersey cows tend to do better, or in other words, have a more successful transition, better startup milk, better peak milk, and, and better early repro um, with a lower DCAD diet, you know, somewhere in the Five three to five five range, um, but but the key is you know measuring it and monitoring it and managing it. Right, that's why measuring the pHs is probably even more critical in the jerseys than with the Holsteins. Yep. You know, and and we talked about if urine pHs is a big range during a close up period. And one of the distinct differences that the, the Jersey cow is going to do is she has a better or stronger ability to sort the diet. And that is something that uh, we're always looking at when we're looking at feed bunks. Can this diet be sorted and is she sorting it? Because uh, it's gonna cause a pH problem, it's gonna cause a dry matter intake problem, and we want her to get that 200 grams of calcium, but if she's sorting the diet and is only getting 100 grams and her uh, body isn't becoming acidified, that's a, a bad cascade. So I'm gonna focus on sorting of the diet uh, in the Jersey cow. Yeah, and one thing to prevent that sorting would be having the moisture levels right in that TMR mix. I mean, oh, it's so, size well. so yep. critical to get the particle size right, the particle length, um, and then have enough moisture in that TMR so that the gals can't sort. Because jerseys with their smaller muscle and the way their tongues work, yeah, they love to sort feet. Mm -hmm. So in, in summary, the Jersey cow is a different cow. Um, we've enjoyed working with her. Todd has an immense passion for the Jersey cow and has uh, all his life. and. And I think he's uh, 
got most of us in the company uh, in tune with uh, the little brown cow and that she is different and requires a little bit different touch from a nutrition consulting standpoint. Well, thank you, everyone, for staying with us as we got through that uh, video. And now we will head into questions with our three experts from Pine Creek Nutrition. And so Jim Tully, Todd Stroop, and Cameron Nightingale are all with us. Cameron serves as the Director of Technical Services for the company. And so just as we did last time, We'll have Cameron uh, kind of take the, the first go at the question and then defer that to, to the others in uh, who he thinks might be the best suited to answer the question. Before I move into the questions that were sent in, I want to remind everyone, you still have time to send us a few questions. We have all four or five on the list, but we'd like a few more. So please do ask a question if one came up along the way. I'd also like to thank the John Bower family for hosting uh, the filming of our, these two webinars, uh, the close-up one as well as our webinar today at his family's dairy. Uh, so we want to extend gratitude to them as well. So I am going to share one of the first questions that came in. And it was actually a question uh, as a result of the last webinar. Uh, but a great way for us to segue into fresh cow monitoring is a little review of close-up cows. Um, so in the, in the first webinar, we talked a lot about milk fever and CCAD diet, Cameron. Um, but if you had to prioritize the metabolic diseases that we see in Jersey cows at transition, what order would you put them in as far as the biggest problem the second biggest problem, and if you do think there is a third <laughs> metabolic disease that disease that should be on that list, um, go ahead and share that as well. I, I think there was a, a bit of an impression that milk fever is the largest challenge, but today we heard a lot more about ketosis. So what do you think, Cameron? Yeah, I'll jump in and, and kind of start, and certainly Jim and Todd um, chime in as, as needed. Um, but I think due to the complexity of, of transition diseases, really the subclinical ones are uh, probably what, what has the largest impact primarily because of the interactions between them. You know, a lot of older research would indicate that upwards of 50% of all fresh cows are subclinically ketotic. So with that said, we've we've backed off on dry matter intake and, and then we kind of expose or set ourselves up to um, some of the other issues that are gonna follow. So I would say in general, ketosis is, is probably the main one, um, but as far as, as clinical impact, milk fever probably moves into the first slot. And, and then we kind of move down from there, um, milk fever being a calcium related disease as are RPs and, and probably metritis to a degree. Um, metritis has some other complexities due to, you know, bacterial challenge or from pulling calves or hard pulls or twins, you know, things like that. But, you know, calcium is needed for all this smooth muscle function. So if we have a depletion of calcium, obviously milk fever is where we gravitate towards our focus. But, you know, we certainly have Im impacts on retained placentas. And um, any of these, you know, are, are likely resultative in a DA. You know, in the first webinar, we looked at um, the risk factor or the interactions or how many more times uh, likely one disease is going to happen in the presence of another. So I, I'll kind of leave that over to uh, Jim or Todd if they want to kind of add on to that. I'll, I'll go ahead and add a little bit to that. Um, obviously, the you know calcium, a little short on calcium when they calve, can lead into other issues. Uh, I would think that ketosis is probably 
the second most that I would be concerned with. Um, you know, the cow goes off feed, she starts losing weight, um, you know, and that's going to lead into other issues as well. Um, the one that I think should be the easiest to solve with any of these would be VA. Now, I can't say that every herd I've ever worked with, that's never been an issue, but in most of them, they definitely shouldn't be as long as, uh, as we talked about in the close-up ration, you get the dry matter intake right, the cow is not going to get a DA if she's eating well. Um, and then I think Cameron covered the metritis and RTs just as good. Okay, great. Okay, let's move ahead to our second question. Um, you mentioned the Precision Extra BHBA testing opportunity in the, the um, presentation today. Uh, it was addressed as a herd prevalence tool. Have you seen dairies implement that as an actual cow side treatment tool? Um, and if so, what would be the right number of days after calving to check that in order to head off a case of ketosis or, uh, you know, a fatty liver, for example, something more uh, progressed? Um, if you were using that as a cow side tool, maybe a little advice on how many days after calving you would, uh, you would use, you know, do that blood test. Um, and so, Cameron, yeah, if you want to. Give us some thoughts, and then, and then maybe Todd, if you want to chime in on this as well. Sure. Uh, we we have a, a number of clients that that use this, um, not necessarily on a weekly basis, but but more monthly, I would say, and a good subset of the fresh pen. And it kind of goes back to you know, twelve is a, a fairly decent representation. Um, more is better, but there's been some some back and forth on what the appropriate days in milk, but as far as applicability of what I see, the five to 15 day in milk range is um, probably most appropriate to give us the best snapshot. There are some people that go down to three days in milk, but the upper end 15 is is kind of the sweet spot where we want to be. So five to 15 is, is uh, the range that we want to be looking for for that. Todd, any thoughts to add to that? Uh, no, I probably only have a handful of herds that do that. Um, I guess I tend to see, you know, some of the really large herds that'll do it is mainly just a benchmark tool to make sure that you're hitting the numbers you want to. If you have to take them because you're having issues, then you you need to get that taken care of anyway. Um, and I, yeah, think I think that's, that's a good point. Something. Yeah, and I, I'll just jump in. That, that's a really good point. If if you're having a high incidence of clinical cases, you know, really all this is going to do is quantify how many out of a population. This is um, probably best used as a surveillance tool um, in order to make preemptive changes in order to avoid clinical cases. And I, I think Jim might be having some technical difficulty. I know he was trying to speak, um, but it's not coming through for some reason. Okay, thanks for the, oh, I think, uh, Jim, you wanna try and share some thoughts now? Um, in relation to the monitoring or testing all cows, right? Yeah, yeah, it's just a question. Okay. Is it a monitoring tool? Or is it a treatment tool? Yeah, I, I have generally found it, since it is very, very specific, to do it as a monitoring tool to see where the trends are going. Seems to be a, a better use of it than saying every cow. I think at some point, if we're in that mode, we're going to be making dramatic changes, altering stuff based on a very small window of data. So I, I, I like it for monitoring. Good. Okay, sounds great. Next question is, um, is there a better time of the day 
to take these different tests such as NEPA, BHBA, or um, blood calcium. So does time of day matter when looking at these three blood tests? Yeah, Jim, you want to go ahead and answer this one? Um, it, it, some of it's going to, you, Cameron, actually, you'll probably be a little bit, bit quicker at it, but mine is do it at the same time, regardless of when you're doing it. But I would want it to be within, oh, a couple of, a couple, three hours after feeding and then be consistent with that um, week over week. Does that make sense, Cameron? Yeah, I think that's, that's the perfect answer, really. Do it. Do at the same time, be consistent about it. You know, similar to the urine pH monitoring, um, we're dealing with right. a metabolism and synthesis of nutrients um, where this is a little bit different. Um, you know, on the urine pH side, you know, we kind of want to do that four or five hours after feeding, um, which gives us an assessment and plenty of time to get blood acidified. Where this one, um, being, being that, uh, ketone body production is going to be relative to nutrient intake. Cows that are going to be high are going to be high because those are probably your ones that are, are not necessarily off feed but have a low dry matter intake. So, um, yeah, do it, do it consistently, do it at the same time, and do it, you know, at some window two to five hours after feeding. Great, great advice. So, the next question is. Uh, the cow side test for BHBA, is that a common test used for humans as well? They ask, did I hear this correctly, that it's available at Walmart? So maybe just uh, go back over again the, the Precision Extra tool and maybe once again just share how that works and where they can buy um, the, the equipment they need to perform that test. Cameron. Sure. The Precision Extra is actually a, uh, I won't say human specific because we are using it for cows, but it was designed and developed um, primarily for, for people that are monitoring um, diabetes and things like that. It's It was designed as a glucose test, but the fact that the different strips are different assays that that measure and monitor different metabolites um, so you can either get glucose strips for them as, a, as an energy balance thing, or there are, are separate strips that measure ketones or BHBA specifically. Um, so yeah, you can get that at, at generally your, your local drugstore, your Walgreens, CVS, Walmart, Amazon. Amazon is, in my experience, the most um, reliable place to get it. Uh, I can say as soon as this became widely available and popularized a little bit, um, you know, after some of the uh, university research came out some years ago, the strips were really hard to get. Um, so there were some stockpiles of them. But anyway, Amazon is probably the best place to get them, but but sometimes you will find them at, at the pharmacy. Great. Thank you. Okay, next question is, what would you recommend as the um, the best number of days in a post fresh group? And is that different for Jersey cows, or do you think it would be the same as uh, maybe in a Holstein herd? You're saying how many days to keep them in in a post in the yeah. in the fresh pen, for example? Yeah, Todd. Yeah, how, Todd, how Todd or Jim, do you uh, have some? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll respond to that. Okay. Um, actually, it's probably very, very specific, um, depending on how much room you have, uh, how your pens are in relationship to the dairy barn. I mean, you want those fresh cows close to the barn. Um, you want the pen sized right. I mean, obviously, I prefer like probably three weeks would be ideal, but I know that that's going to make it probably 18 to 28 days. Um, I, I don't necessarily like pens that go past four weeks, um, if you're going to design a ration specific for those cows. Great. And just a follow up to that, uh, we talked in the last webinar quite a bit about splitting heifers from mature cows. Would you see an advantage in doing that post fresh as well? 
Well, to to me, that's a no-brainer. If you're able to keep your fresh heifers away from your fresh cows, you need to do it. Um, I even go as far as to tell my guys, I would rather them, you know, if they only have one fresh pen, only use mature cows in there so they can't beat up on the heifers. And I would put the first lactation heifers straight into a first lactation pen. I mean, hopefully you're not having that many issues with your first lactation animals. Yeah, so, that's a great idea. But in order to to kind of optimize, you know, their health, well-being and output, you know, it, it is important as well. Um, also, some considerations are, you know, the logistics around this. Todd, Todd mentioned um, pen size and space. So, you know, a lot of this has to do with calving cycles. Are we in, you know, a heavy calving period versus low or regular, um, you know, size of the dairy. Also, load size, uh, if you are targeting a specific fresh cow ration. Um, so even, even if you split cows and heifers or if you have a 21 day post fresh pen, there, there could be some considerations and discussions revolving around um, the implementation of a fresh diet versus putting them right onto a high cow diet and so on and so forth. There's, there's some other logistical considerations there. Yeah. Great. Next question. What is the desired body condition score for the close up Jersey cow? And is that consistent with a Holstein herd? Uh, if, if you're feeding a mixed herd, Jim, you want to go ahead with this one? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, in, in my experience, and, and this might be a, a good time for Todd and Cameron and I to talk about it, I, I, I really <laughs> haven't noticed uh, a big difference. I like a score of four, and, and I get a body condition score of four. I want a soft U, kind of between the hooks and the pins, um, maybe C ribs, uh, but but hopefully not when she's standing still. Maybe see the last rib or two when she's walking, and and that's what I put down as a, a score of four. Probably have noticed that jerseys can transition better if they're a little bit heavier, maybe than some of the my Holstein uh, herds. But I would still want to target that three and a half as a minimum, and and I'd really like fours uh, at cabin. I <clears throat> I think that's another one that's kind of farm specific as well because the main thing is to have the same person scoring those cows uh, because you're going to get a quarter point difference between people looking at those cows. Um, what Jim's calling the four, I'm, I might would call three point seven five, um, but I think you can bring in those heavier animals without issues. As long as the dry matter intake's good, the ration's balanced, um, they come in, you know, they get a good fresh cow diet that keeps them going. Um, I don't mind the cow being a little bit on the heavy side, but I also know from past experience that cows that are thinner <laughs> are more likely to do well as far as not having issues, and I think it's because they tend to eat more. Uh, because they're not quite as heavy. So ideally, to me, it would be like a 3.75 to a 4 when they calve. Uh, but, I, you know, as far as the difference between Jersey and Holstein, I kind of feel like, Jim, the Holsteins might give you a little more issue if they're too heavy, and I think it's just because of their size. Um, they got a lot more weight to carry around. They can just have more issues if things don't go just right. Right. So I'll kind of deviate from the group think I kind of like a little bit leaner cow through the transition uh, and leaner uh, a three, five to three, seven, five. But I think Todd hit the nail on the head there. In, in my experience, scoring cows with a number of different people, there's a lot of subjectivity that goes along and, and a quarter point difference between my eye and yours is, is, probably most likely to happen 
uh, even though we do have measures, you know, there, there's a lot of training tools available to get, you know, make it more a finite science. But, you know, realistically, when we're walking groups of cows, we're we're not doing calculations in our head to figure out the exact body condition score. Um, but I think to that point, another really important um, thing to note is consistency of body condition in those pens. You know, if we have more than, say, uh, I don't know, Todd and I talk about this quite a bit, uh, you know, between five and 10 percent variance outside of the group, you know, those are some special consideration times. So so consistency yeah. among cows in those groups is, is really important as well. Yeah, I always like to use the 90 percent rule. If you can have 90 percent of the cows in most any group the way you want them. There's probably not a whole lot you need to do to the ration because you're going to have, like Cameron said, five to ten percent that are going to be outside that range, just based on other factors. So, I find that ninety percent rule to work really well. And it's much easier to figure out which cows in the group are we formulating the diet for. Sure. Yeah, really great, great discussion, and. Uh, a little vari variation on thought there, so I think that that always helps everyone kind of bend their mind around uh, what they should be seeing when they look through their own their own pen of cows. So the next question is, what do you think is adequate dry matter intake for close-up mature Jersey cows? Um, Want to start us off? Yeah, I'll, I'll throw mine out from what I see and. Again, if we take the subjectivity out as far as push outs and average intakes in a group and in a in a group of mature jerseys and the other the other caveat to that is how many days in the close up. So if we've got a 14 to 21 day period, obviously that intake is going to be a tick lower. Um, so you just kind of have to keep that in mind when you're when you're working through those observations and metrics. But, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 24 or 25 pounds of uh, dry matter intake actual uh, is probably acceptable. We'll see if Jim and Todd have mm -hmm. uh, some other input there. I, I think that's that's right on. Um, I tend to, uh, well, I, I tend not to worry because of some of those factors, Cameron, like you said, the way backs, whatever, if they're doing it. If, if I'm hearing less than, no, 22, I'll start paying pretty good attention to that. If the herd's saying, oh, my close-ups are only eating 18 pounds, meaning mature cows, yeah, then then we have an issue. But, yeah, if we can get the 24, I, I generally don't see any challenges with that. Yeah, yeah, I, I like balance for 24 to 25, um, and a lot of times they eat 23. So, yeah, that 22 to 25 number is going to work. Which that brings up a good point, Todd. I mean, it, it kind of wraps this all into a neat little package of a lot of the things we've discussed. You know, we're really targeting a, a nutrient flow, not balancing ration for, say, percent of dry matter. You know, animals don't eat percents. So when those intakes deviate off of the balanced diet within whatever your acceptable range is, you know, a reformulation is is necessary. You know, for example, if we're targeting 200 grams of calcium, that's 1% of dry matter at 22 pounds versus 25 pounds. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Right. Yeah, I, I just did the math quick, and that 200 gram of calcium number I like to use, if I do it on 24 pounds, it's 200. But if they only eat 22, it's still 180, which is still in the range I like. So maybe that's why I get away with it. <laughs> Very good. Next question is uh, back to the discussion we had about how many days in the post fresh group is ideal. Uh, the question is, can we actually limit peak milk production by keeping cows in that post fresh pen too long? For example, if they're in that that group past two or three weeks. Jim, uh, Jim and I had a, a, a really lengthy, good discussion about this just a week or so ago. So I, I think uh, Jim would be a good, good one to answer this one. 
Yeah. The the way I look at it is is it's actually fairly complex and, and try and make it pretty short here. That fresh cow, um, her physiology does have a different nutrient requirement base than than a peak cow. Um, but that that'd be a, a different discussion. Maybe Dr. Wise will get into that when he talks about lactation. But when I when I see this question of of are they in the fresh pen too long if it's past two weeks, it, the only way that would be a problem is if they're on a very low energy density fresh cow diet. Um, the diets that we put together for a fresh pen are probably somewhere optimum two to maybe four weeks. I agree with Todd's comment earlier. If it's after four weeks, uh, we don't need them in the fresh pen. But if it's a, a moderate energy diet, uh, well balanced for uh, metabolizable protein, um, that you, you should have no issues at two weeks or even up to the four weeks. Um, and, and then a other point Todd made, and, and I'll, I'll reiterate it, is the facility is the big factor. I, I tell my clients if, if they're calving a whole bunch and they're saying, oh, my fresh cows are only in the pen for a week, um, you wanted them in there for two, I, I tell them a week is fine. Let's give them a start. Let's not crowd them uh, and then move them out. The facility is going to dictate it. But to answer the question, no, I don't think two weeks is going to hurt unless it's a very low energy density diet. I'll, I'll throw out an add on to that as well. I know w when people are spending a lot of time with their fresh cows and, and treating them more as individuals, um, if a cow doesn't look like she's getting off to a great start, I know a lot of people uh, kind of lean towards, well, let's keep them in the fresh pen longer. When in reality, it might not be an intake thing. It might be just what Jim kind of hit on as far as it's a lower energy diet and she's milking well. That's why she looks a little thin or gant or whatever. And that might be the cow that benefits from from moving on into the high cow diet. I mean, obviously, depending on on what other individual attributes that cow has, but just uh, just another consideration. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah, great advice. And um, my next question has to do with uh, the post fresh pen as well. Uh, there was a bit of a trend for multiple milking of fresh cows. Um, you know, three X herds milking fresh cows, four, five, or maybe even six X, two X herds going to four X for that 21 to 28 days post fresh. Um, have you had any, the three of you, have you had any experience with that? Um, is it is it something that you think works, or is it a trend that has seen its better day? <laughs> Cameron, I'll let you go first. Yeah, so my experience um, would probably lead me to say I'm going to pass the buck on this one because <laughs> a lot of the people that I've worked with have done this, have not done it with enough tenacity. In other words, they haven't stuck with the program long enough, you know, for us to see and and truly evaluate um peaks and persistency as a response to milking frequency so i'll let uh i'll let jim or todd throw their two cents in on that one i i like it i highly recommend it um and it it works very well on on one of my uh jersey herds uh one of the highest uh, producing herds in in California, but he manages it very well. It's uh, they're they're milked in about 20 minutes, uh, so they're not away from the barn very long. Um, they're very close to the parlor. Intakes have gone up. Uh, no way to really do any science on it, but but he feels intakes are up uh, at least a pound, probably two pounds. Um, of milk. These are on 4X. They're a 4X uh, fresh pen, and then they're going to three. So it's interesting that he went from three to four on the mature cows, not the first, and he is very happy. Um, I, I like it from the, the the physiology. Every time she goes in, she's going to have that release of oxytocin. It's going to help clear, clean her up some. Um, it does seem like it's priming them for a little three to four pound higher peaks. 
uh, especially with BST going. So they're they're very happy with it on mature cows. I, Great. Go ahead, I, go ahead. I guess I'll say a little something about that because in my experience, I've had several dairies try it over the last 15 years, um, and all of them have gone back to whatever they were previously doing, whether it was twice a day or 3X. Um, I actually don't work with any 3X herds, Jersey herds right now. Um, but if a uh, twice a day Jersey herd does want to milk three times just for their fresh pens, I would be okay with that. I don't think past three or four weeks they, they need it. Um, I honestly just haven't seen the results uh, that I felt made it worthwhile to do it, even in some of the highest herds I've ever worked with. So. I'll throw yeah. out there too, just to kind of add and, and, you know, kind of add on to what Jim and Todd both said. That's one of those situations that, that takes some kind of critical evaluation, some true numbers, not just perception, take the subjectivity okay. out. And it's real easy to make that situation a two-legged problem, not a four-legged problem. So if your, your right. objective is to milk those fresh cows 4X, don't just stick them in when you can get them in and, and rush them through the barn. And, you know, if, if your barn's already full and you're already kind of pushing the time clock, it's maybe not the best idea. So yeah. just some, some other. It's, other it's def yeah, it's definitely facility oriented as to whether or not you can make it work. I think I know the herd Jim's talking about and they're set up. They can get those cows in and out so quickly. Um, it, they probably do see a good response. Um, I would say most places are not set up to do it that fast. Great, great discussion, and sounds like the jury's still out, so as uh, almost every paper ends, uh, more research is needed, right? <laughs> um, yeah. I'd, I'd really like to thank the three of you for taking your time to not only producing two really great high-quality videos packed with great information, but taking your time to be with us and be available for questions here at the end of both of these seminars. Once again, our gratitude goes to Jim Tully, Cameron Nightingale, and Todd Stroop from uh, Pine Creek uh, Nutrition Services. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. And we'd also like to thank everyone who is listening in and watching with us today. Just a reminder that this was the second of our presentations, and we will be hosting three more. The next one will be about managing the milking herd, and we'll have Bill Weiss from and Maurice Eastridge from the uh, Ohio State University. And they will be hosting that webinar with us on Thursday instead of Wednesday, Thursday, September 27th, once again at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. I'd like to just thank uh, the American Jersey Cattle Association for hosting this great webinar series and for having me here today. To, uh, to be with you. And for more information, just a reminder, you can head over to National All Jersey at US, NAJ, sorry about that, NAJ at usjersey.com where you can sign up for future webinars or uh, get access to the video recording of previous webinars. Once again, thanks everyone for being here today and we look forward to being with you once again on the 27th. Bye-bye.